I've wanted to be a doctor ever since I was seven years old. And trying to recollect what could have put that into my mind, I think it was my parents' rather exaggerated respect for our own paediatrician, the redoubtable Professor Knöpfermacher, who was held up as a bit of a hero in the family. The specialty I went into is called immunology. And immunology, it's all about prevention. It's about vaccines. It's about stopping death. So it was very much actually along the lines of preventing disease and preventing death. My dad uh, died at the age of uh, 68 of a uh, clot in his uh, main artery of the brain. So he died of a stroke. And in point of fact, a week or so before this event, he had a prodromal situation, something which we call posterior inferior cerebellar artery thrombosis or PICA, and where the symptoms were very classical, the symptoms of lack of balance, staggering, perfectly compass mentis, no mental defect, but stumbling over the words because of poor articulation and so forth. And uh, he lived in Sydney, I lived in Melbourne, and I said, oh, Dad, this is not too good. What, what have you done to yourself? You've got many a disease, or sort of half joking around like that. And I said, in any case, maybe I'll come up and see you. He said, oh, no, don't bother about that, you know. This was, say, on a Monday or a Tuesday. And I said, well, OK, I'll leave till the weekend. And uh, sure enough, on the Friday afternoon, I hopped on a plane and he died while I was in the air. So I just missed seeing him. And that left a, a, a great deal of sadness in my heart. I would have liked to have been able to embrace him at least I was able to give some comfort to my mother anyway. That was one part of it. My elder brother, Peter, who died at the age of 33 by his own hand. And Peter had the most vicious and the most classical case of bipolar disorder that you have ever, ever seen. He could have been straight out of a textbook. These manic periods when he was so excitable and full of energy and you know, would go days without sleeping and full of brilliant and wild ideas, followed by this devilish, deep, impenetrable depression that brought him so low that he was essentially functionless. It was a pretty horrendous thing to experience with a brother that you loved. And it came fairly suddenly up until it struck in his very early 30s. He was a normal, aggressive, ambitious, successful young university lecturer. But when this bipolar struck, it was absolutely devastating. In point of fact, it was something there that was always in the background. You realised that you couldn't take life for granted, that everything would always come up roses, and that there is, within the human being, this capacity for self-destruction. And that has been part of my experience since my 20s. I think I've had a very sober attitude towards death. Being a doctor myself and in practice, uh, part-time practice as a locum for quite a few years, you encounter death, it becomes a part of the regular fabric of your work and of your being. Uh, it might sound strange to say this, but you don't imbue it with a special significance. Well, I think palliative care to me means using the tools of modern medicine and psychology and psychiatry to lessen the burden of pain and disability as the patient deteriorates. So in other words, you're, less, you're lowering suffering, you're lessening suffering. And that to me is just as worthwhile as preventing death, I think. I would rank it as extremely important. I don't think we should kid ourselves. I think there are some 
diseases straightforwardly, you know, like appendicitis, like a ruptured peptic ulcer, something like that, we would come in dramatically cure, and it's, it's a wonderful thing. But most of the time in medicine, really you're putting your finger in the dike a little bit, you know, you're ameliorating a condition which in uh, the long run is going to catch up with you. And I think that's all part and parcel of the broad fabric of medical practice. So I see that as a kind of a continuum, you know, the occasional dramatic cure which makes everybody feel absolutely wonderful. Uh, the occasional complete dejection at not being able to do a damn thing and just watching the patient dying, trying hard to relieve the pain. I think that's sort of a continuum. And that's the fascination of medicine too. Definitely when you're working in medicine and you're struggling hard to bring all the top scientific principles to bear on preventing disease, curing disease, alleviating symptoms, death seems something that you want to push away, that you want to keep far away. But that being said, I was never unrealistic. I recognise that the fight against disease is a fight that you sometimes win, sometimes lose, sometimes it's a draw. And death is one of the possible outcomes that you shouldn't feel too badly about because if it happens, it happens. So much of your work seeks to deny death, seeks to foil death, seeks to make death impossible. And so when death comes, it is to a degree a recognition of the limits of your power, the limits of the power of scientific medicine. And if you want, it's a kind of defeat. And so I think that's probably one reason why people don't particularly want to face that too squarely. On the rare occasions when I find myself with a medical colleague discussing this type of matter, we don't shy away from death because we recognise its inevitability. And when I say that to a degree it's a sign of your failure, in your heart of hearts you know it's not a personal failure. It's a failure of the system of knowledge which hasn't yet advanced far enough to prevent death in a, in a large number of situations. So it's not something that you can kind of accuse yourself of, of having done badly. I don't have any hesitation about discussing death with my colleagues and of course a lot of the time the attempt is to provide a comfortable and uh, reasonable and peaceful death to the person concerned. In fact, to be absolutely frank, most of the doctors that I talk to about death are very realistic. You know, uh, they recognise that if you're in, in medicine in a serious kind of a way, you will encounter patients which have illnesses that are fatal, that are terminal, that are incurable, and it just becomes part of the business. First, do no harm. That's kind of really the first principle of medicine. And once your interventions to try to postpone death become meddlesome and ineffective, they're actually not very good. And a much better pathway might be to accommodate the idea of death, come to terms with the idea of death, help the patient without doing so in so many words recognise that the end is coming, that we shall make it as tranquil as we can, as pain-free as we can, that's very important, and uh, as much imbued with the love of friends and loved ones and relatives and, and put your energies into that rather than trying to deny something that in the end result is absolutely inevitable. Preparing for death quietly and peacefully in the tranquility, hopefully, of one's own family can be quite a satisfying thing. I wasn't going to say a joyous thing, it won't be a joyous thing, but it'll be something that can be done 
uh, that you feel good about afterwards. As far as I'm concerned, palliative medicine really involves two things. First of all, it involves medication and other care such as rest or elevation of a diseased limb or something like that, a purely a physical thing. Arguably more important is the psychological support that gives someone who is suffering whom you will not be able to cure but you will be able to stand beside them and say, well, here we are, this is what the situation is, we're doing what we can, things will be a bit better tomorrow. That palliative care, caring in the human sense of the word. And I think those two, the strictly medical and the strictly psychological, go together and buttress each other up. I haven't seen too much of the over-medicalising of the end-of-life care. I mean, what are you going to try and do? First of all, relieve pain, OK? No one these days should die a painful death. And if in point of fact the dosage of morphine that you need is so high that it sends the person uh, unconscious or into a coma, I don't consider that bad practice. I consider that good practice because, in fact, no one deserves to die in agonising pain. But most of the time, uh, with particularly with a lingering illness like cancer, in a funny sort of way, people can see it coming and they know this is not too great and they are, you know, under strong medication. And I think if you can make that process Peaceful, serene, undramatic, as undramatic as it's reasonable to expect. You do a good job as a doctor, and I don't think we do too badly in Australia in that respect. Ivan Illich wrote extensively about this question of the enormous proportion of the health dollars that goes towards people who have less than a year to live. And he railed against this and thought it was a bad thing. It's an add-on. So... Most of the time you go along, you see your doctor, you get prescribed medicines, you sometimes get put into hospital, and it's all part and parcel of the wide world of medicine. And then comes the final cataclysmic period where the whole thing is ratcheted up a few degrees, and of course it becomes more expensive, and of course it uh, is uh, a more intense experience for both patient and doctor. But I don't see a disjunction there. I don't see anything wrong in that. I think that's, I think that's perfectly natural. <music> Lewis Thomas, the uh, great distinguished American physician, once wrote a book about medical science and just called it the youngest science. We don't understand that much about it, you know. And uh, I thought that that's a, that's a good thing to remember. If we failed, we failed uh, in a way gloriously by trying the best we can, by trying the best that human minds have so far been able to fashion. And if it's not good enough, it is because the science is a young science still evolving, hopefully decade by decade getting better. I know that death is something that most people prefer not to talk about, but uh, you know, when you live your life in science, you become a realist <laughs> and you re recognise that death is an essential part of life and uh, you'd better have some views about it and you'd better be ready for it and you'd better deal with it in a in a sensible and sensitive manner rather than rejecting it outright and pretending it doesn't exist. In my book, when life begins, in the beginning there's already a harbinger of the end. It's not meant to be forever. It won't be forever. Live it as fully and as well as you can. Uh, obey the golden rule. That's tremendously important. You know, don't make it all relate to me, me, me all the time, but try and use your time on this earth to 
to good and to interact positively with others and you should find life on the whole a joyous experience.